Hi, it's Miss Christy, and we're reading Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by Harriet Jacobs. And Linda has had her first child, who's a boy, and she has yet to give him a name. And um, he struggles in health, as does she. And this is chapter 12, which is XII in Roman numerals, and it's called Fear of Insurrection. Not far from this time, Nat Turner's insurrection bro broke out, and the news threw our town into great commotion. Strange that they should be alarmed when their slaves were so contented and happy. But so it was. It was always the custom to have a muster every year. Excuse me. On that occasion, every white man shouldered his musket. The citizens and the so-called country gentlemen wore military uniforms. The poor whites took their place in the ranks in everyday dress, some without shoes, some without hats. This grand occasion had already passed, and when the slaves were told there was to be another muster, they were surprised and rejoiced. Poor creatures, they thought it was going to be a holiday. I was informed of the true state of affairs and imparted it to the few I could trust. Most gladly would I have proclaimed it to every slave, but I dared not. All could not be relied on. Mighty is the power of the torturing lash. By sunrise, people were pouring in from every quarter within 20 miles of the town. I knew the houses were to be searched, and I expected it would be done by country bullies or the poor whites. I knew nothing annoyed them so much as to see colored people living in comfort and respectability, so I made arrangements for them with a special care. I arranged everything in my grandmother's house as neatly as possible. I put white quilts on the bed and decorated some of the rooms with flowers. <laughs> when all was arranged, I sat down in the window to watch. Far as my eye could reach, it rested on the motley crew of uh, soldiers. Drums and fives were discoursing martial music. The men were divided into companies of 16, each headed by a captain. Orders were given, and the wild scouts rushed in every direction where a colored face was to be found. It was a grand opportunity for the low whites who had uh, no Negroes of their own to scourge. They exalted in such a chance to exercise a little brief authority and show their subserviency to slaveholders. Not reflecting that the power which trampled on the colored people also kept themselves in poverty, ignorance, and moral degradation. Those who never witnessed such scenes can hardly believe what I know was inflicted at this time on innocent men, women, and children, against whom they were not the slightest ground for suspicion. Colored people and slaves who lived in remote parts of the town suffered in an especial manner. In some cases, the searchers scattered powder and shot among their clothes and then sent other parties to find them and bring them forward as proof that they were plotting insurrection. Everywhere, men, women, and children were whipped till the blood stood in puddles at their feet. Some received 500 lashes. Others were tied hands and feet and tortured with a bucking paddle with blisters, the skin ter which blisters the skin terribly. The dwellings of the colored people, unless they happened to be protected by some influential white person who was nigh at hand, uh, were robbed of clothing and everything else the marauders thought worth carrying away. All day long, these unfeeling wretches went round like a troop of demons, terrifying and tormenting the helpless. At night, they formed themselves into patrol bands and went wherever they chose among the colored people, acting out their brutal will. Many women hid themselves in woods and swamps to keep out of their way. If any of the husbands or fathers told of their outrages, they were tied up to the public whipping post and cruelly scourged for telling lies about white men. The consternation was universal. No two people that had the slightest tinge of color in their faces dared to be seen talking together. I entertained no positive fears about our household because we were in the midst of white families who would protect us. We were ready to receive the soldiers whenever they came. It was not long before we heard the tramp of feet and the sound of voices. The door was rudely pushed open and they tumbled in like a pack of hungry wolves. They snatched at everything within their reach. Every box, trunk, closet, and corner went, underwent a thorough examination. A box in one of the drawers containing some silver change was eagerly pounced upon. When I stepped forward to take it from them, one of the soldiers turned and said angrily, What do you follow us for? Do you suppose white folks has come to steal? So um, this was in reaction to the Nat Turner insurrection, which was really awful. Um... But, you know, they felt like they needed to do that. Uh, uh, some slaves 
uh, massacred a bunch of white people. So the white people in turn tried to put fear back into the slaves and the um, African Americans who were free to keep them under control. So this is why this is happening. I replied, you have come to search, but you have searched that box and I will take it if you please. At that moment, I saw a white gentleman who was friendly to us and I called to him and asked him to have the goodness to come in and stay till the search was over. He readily complied. His entrance into the house brought in the captain of the company whose business it was to guard the outside of the house and see that none of the inmates left it. This officer was Mr. Litch, the wealthy slaveholder whom I mentioned in the account of neighboring planters as being notorious for his cruelty. He felt above soiling his hands with the search. He merely gave orders, and if a bit of writing was discovered, it was carried to him by his ignorant followers who were, un who were unable to read. My grandmother had a large trunk of bedding and tablecloths. When that was open, there was a great shout of surprise, and one exclaimed, Where'd the damn ants get all this sheet and tablecloth? My grandmother, emboldened by the presence of our white protector, said, You may be sure we didn't pilfer them from your houses. <laughs> Look here, Mammy, said a grim-looking fellow without any coat. You seem to feel mighty grand because you got all, all them air fixings. White folks ought to have them all. His remarks were interrupted by a chorus of voices shouting, We's got him! We's got him! Dis here yellow's gals got letters! There was a general rush for the supposed letter, which upon examination proved to be some verses written to me by a friend. In packing away my things, I overlooked them. When their captain informed them of their contents, they seemed much disappointed. He inquired of me who wrote them. I told him it was one of my friends. Can you read them? he asked. When I told him I could, he swore and raved and tore the paper into bits. Bring me all your letters, said he in a commanding tone. I told him I had none. Don't be afraid, he continued in an insinuating way. Bring them all to me. Nobody shall do you any harm. Seeing I did not move to obey, his pleasant tone changed to oaths and threats. Who writes to you? Have free ends? inquired he. I replied, oh no, most of my letters are from white people. Some request me to burn them after they are read, and some I destroy without reading. An exclamation of surprise from some of the company put a stop to our conversation. Some silver spoons, which ornamented an old-fashioned buffet, had just been discovered. My grandmother was in the habit of preserving fruit from many ladies in the town and of preparing suppers for parties. Consequently, she had many jars of preserves. Um, the closet that contained these was next invaded and the contents tasted. One of them, who was helping himself freely, tapped his neighbor on the shoulder and said, Well done. Don't wonder the ants want to kill all the white folks when they live on salves, meaning preserves. I stretched out my hand to take the jar, saying, You were sent here to search for sweetmeats. And what were, and what were we sent for, said the captain, bristling up to me. I evaded the question. The search of the house was completed and nothing, and you were not sent here, and nothing, to found, nothing found to condemn us. They next proceeded to the garden and knocked about every bush and vine with no better success. The captain called his men together and after a short consultation, the order to march was given. As they passed out of the gate, the captain turned back, pronounced a malediction, malediction on the house. He said it ought to be burned to the ground and each of its inmates received 39 lashes. We came out of this affair very fortunately, not losing anything except some wearing apparel. Towards evening, the turbulence increased. The soldiers, stimulated by drink, committed still greater cruelties. Shrieks and shouts continually rent the air. Not daring to go to the door, I peeped under the yellow curtain. I saw a mob dragging along a number of colored people, each white man with his musket upraised, threatening instant death if they did not stop their shrieks. Among the prisoner was a respectable old colored minister. They had found a few parcels of shot in his house, which his wife had for, many, had for years used to balance her scales. For this, they were going to shoot him on the courthouse green. What a spectacle was that for a civilized country. A rabble staggering um, under intoxication, assuming to be the administrators of justice. The better class of the community exerted their influence to save the innocent persecuted people. And in several instances, they succeeded by keeping them shut up in jail till the excitement abated. 
At last, the white citizens found that their property was not safe from the lawless rabble that had summoned to protect them. They rallied the drunken swarm, drove them back into the country, and set a guard over the town. The next day, the town patrols were commissioned to search colored people that lived out of the city, and the most shocking outrages were committed with perfect impunity. Every day for a fortnight, if I looked out, I saw horsemen with some poor panting Negro tied to their saddles and compelled by the lash to keep up their speed till they arrived at the jail yard. Those who had been whipped too unmercifully to walk were washed with brine, tossed into a cart, and carried to jail. One black man who had not fortitude uh, to endure scourging promised to uh, give information about the conspiracy, but it turned out that he knew nothing at all. He had not even heard of the name Nat Turner. The poor fellow, however, had, however, made up a story which augmented his own sufferings and those of the colored people. The day patrol continued for some weeks, and at sundown, uh, a night guard was substituted. Nothing at all was proved against the colored people bond or free. The wrath of the slaveholders was somewhat appeased by the capture of Nat Turner. The imprisoned were released, the slaves were sent to their masters, and the free were permitted to return to their ravaged homes. Visiting was strictly forbidden on the plantation. The slaves begged the privilege of again meeting at their little church in the woods with their burying ground around it. It was built by the colored people and they had no higher happiness than to meet there and sing hymns together and pour out their hearts in spontaneous prayer. Their request was denied and the church was demolished. They were permitted to attend the white churches, a certain portion of the galleries being appropriated to their use. There, when everybody else had partaken of the communion and the benediction had been pronounced, the minister said, come down now, my colored friends. They obeyed the summons and partook of the bread and wine in commemoration of the meek and lowly Jesus, who said, God is your father and all ye are brethren. Hmm. 